الأخوة والأخوات تتصدر القضية الفلسطينية ثمان بلادكم ونجدد رفض المملكة وإدانتها شديدة جرائم السلطة الاحتلال الإسرائيلية بحق الشعب الفلسطيني متجاهل القانون الدولي والإنساني في فصل جديد ومرير من المعاناة. The Saudi Arabian government's decision to pivot on the issue of normalization with Israel without the establishment of a Palestinian state is, in many ways, a historic moment that signals a broader shift in the region's geopolitical landscape. Though this U-turn may seem surprising on the surface, it had been anticipated by many, especially given the political dynamics at play within the Saudi leadership under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, MBS. The move ultimately serves as a direct rebuke to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's long-standing stance of opposing the creation of a Palestinian state with its own military, economy and sovereignty. Netanyahu's push for normalization without Palestinian statehood was seen as a way to further entrench Israel's control over the region, particularly through the expansionist vision of a greater Israel that stretches from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. In this plan, there is little room for a truly sovereign Palestinian entity, as Netanyahu and his government appear determined to solidify Israeli dominance over all the territories they currently occupy. If the Arab world, led by Saudi Arabia, had fully normalized ties with Israel without any concessions for the Palestinians, it could have marked the de facto end of the Palestinian cause for statehood. Such normalization would have removed one of the last major levers of pressure on Israel, allowing Netanyahu to pursue his broader territorial ambitions with minimal resistance. <laughs> تتصدر القضية الفلسطينية ثمان بلادكم ونجدد رفض المملكة وإدانتها شديدة جرائم السلطة الاحتلال الإسرائيلية بحق الشعب الفلسطيني متجاهل القانون الدولي والإنساني في فصل جديد ومرير من المعاناة ولن تتوقف المملكة عن عملها الدؤوب في سبيل قيام دولة فلسطينية مستقلة وعاصمتها القدس الشرقية ونؤكد أن المملكة لن تقيم علاقات دبلوماسية مع إسرائيل دون ذلك ونتوجه بالشكر إلى الدول التي اعترفت بالدولة الفلسطينية تسيدا الشرعية الدولية ونحث باقي الدول على القيام بخطوات مماثلة. In this dramatic and highly publicized televised statement, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman unequivocally dashed hopes for any such normalization to take place under current conditions. He declared, The Saudi Kingdom will not stop its tireless work towards the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. We affirm that the kingdom will not establish diplomatic relations with Israel without that. This statement couldn't have been clearer in its rejection of any diplomatic engagement with Israel that doesn't prioritize the creation of a Palestinian state. MBS's words came as a significant blow to the Biden administration, which had been working behind the scenes to broker a major deal that would have normalized Saudi-Israeli relations. Such an agreement would have been viewed as a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy in the region, giving Washington an opportunity to solidify alliances while countering rising Chinese influence in the Middle East. The so-called Grand Bargain, which top Biden officials like Brett McGurk and Jake Sullivan had championed, envisioned a threefold solution. Counterbalancing China's growing sway, addressing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, and topping former President Trump's Abraham Accords by achieving normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. In return, Riyadh would have secured a U.S. defense pact and support for a civilian nuclear program. However, MBS's firm stance effectively put an end to these hopes. While the Biden administration had hinted that it might move forward with the U.S.-Saudi defense agreement, even in the absence of a normalization deal, the Crown Prince's remarks left little room for ambiguity. Without a concrete commitment to the Palestinian cause, there would be no diplomatic breakthrough between the two regional powers. The Saudi ambassador to the United Kingdom summed up the new policy position in a succinct way. I've heard a lot of people criticise Saudi for not doing more. And I think, A, that's unfair. Um, short of going war to war with Israel, I'm not entirely sure what more Saudi Arabia can do. You've seen the foreign minister uh, lead a, a delegation from the OIC going to international capitals all around the world over the last six months, trying to put pressure on the community, the international community to push more for a ceasefire. Um, we have, in terms of aid, we've, we've done a lot in terms of aid. 
we're pulling every political string that we can, but we are not quite there yet. And uh, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, at the end of the day, we can all agree on what the right solution is. But if the players on the ground don't agree, I think it's difficult to make it happen. And that's where more and more pressure can come in. When you say pressure, like exactly what kind of pressure? Because currently we have 40 plus thousand Palestinians dead, 100,000 injured or dead in total. And these are the numbers that, you know, people can dispute the numbers all they like. It could potentially be more. The Americans have been pushing as, as hard as they think they can. But one thing you learn in life is that you can always do more. Uh, and the minute you say we can't do more, you've given up. And to give up on what's happening now would be a true disaster. You know, the Israeli-Palestinian problem, unlike many others, rightly or wrongly, affects people all around the world in the way that very few conflicts have and certainly do at the moment. You see in the protests, you see in London, across the United States, across Europe, in the Middle East, everyone is affected and motivated by what's happening on the ground. So the Israelis and the Palestinians have a responsibility, whether they like it or not, to the world. That may not be fair, but it is what it is. And unfortunately, certainly the Israeli government, which we all expected to be more responsible, is not being a responsible player. Where does that leave normalization with Saudi Arabia, with the kingdom? We've always said we, there is no normalization without a credible solution to the Palestinian problem. And the solution to the Palestinian problem is a Palestinian state. If we don't have an irreversible path towards that, we can't even begin the discussion on normalization. Um, we have made the effort, and unfortunately, this government in Israel is taking every possible step to move away from that. So under these circumstances, with this particular government, Saudi Arabia couldn't go into any kind of discussion around normalization? Because we've heard Netanyahu say that two-state solution is not something he would consider. There's your answer. If he's not going to consider where, um, what we need, and our position was made clear as far back as 1981 by King Fahad, um, reiterated in, in the mid-2000s with the King Abdullah peace plan, our peace initiative, which then became the Islamic peace initiative, we all know what we agree on. And the majority of people in the region and around the world have agreed on it. Um, if he's decided that that's not the case, then that changes the dynamics of what the normalization talks were. And if anyone was under the wrong impression that we would give up the Palestinians for normalization, they've misunderstood everything we've said. Are you also seeing American power and its limitations in play here? Is that a realization that, that Saudi Arabia and perhaps the region is coming to? I don't, I'm not involved in what's happening in the state, so it's difficult for me to gauge that. Um, but in terms of the pressure that they are able to put on a state like Israel to perhaps stop the fighting or stop the bombing and, and the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza? It doesn't seem to me that it's a limitation of power. Um, it's a complicated choice that countries have to make, and each country has a right to make the best choices for themselves. But I think it's difficult to argue America's power is diminished. It's still the most powerful country in the world by a long way, economically, militarily. Um, and I don't think that's going to change in, in, uh, in the short term or the near term or the medium term. Do you think that Trump would do anything differently to what Biden is doing? Well, he's a different person, but I can't tell you what he's going to do until he does it. Uh, we'll find out in a few months' time, inshallah. In terms of this, um, this war, though, I mean, he says Hamas probably wouldn't have launched October 7. The war in Ukraine probably wouldn't have happened had he been in power because on some level he believes that he, you know, uses power in a different way. There are plenty of ways to use power. Um, once one is in office, um, the realities of, of the world change the decisions you make. Unfortunately, this conflict is developing and will likely continue developing. Um, I think that, you know, as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, and the United States is not my portfolio, but we consider the United States our friends, whether, regardless of who the president is, whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's uh, Donald Trump, we will work with both of them to further um, the right causes in the region. And I think 
you know, the Palestinians have a just cause at the moment and it's being obliterated. Something that I'm um, monitoring is the situation in Afghanistan and obviously Saudi Arabia is a, a leader in the Muslim world. When we hear the Taliban restrict girls from going to school, they've uh, put more draconian laws in place, preventing women from their voices from even being heard in public spaces. What role can Saudi play, do you think, uh, you know, as, as uh, leaders of the Muslim world to perhaps put pressure on the Taliban or to engage with them on some level um, so that, you know, the pressure, the kind of pressure we're seeing on the civilians in Afghanistan I is eased? I mean, the, the best pressure we can put is the example that we provide. Um, we are championing women's position in society in Saudi Arabia uh, for a long time. Women have been educated. In fact, there are more women in, in schools and universities than there are men um, in Saudi Arabia. You look at um, my sister, who is our ambassador in Washington, was the first Saudi uh, woman ambassador around the world. Women are breaking barriers constantly in Saudi Arabia. And if that's what we are um, promoting and that is what we are supporting, that's the best message we can send to anyone out there. It's not my role to tell people in their own countries how to behave and what to do, but we would assume we would like people to behave the way we do. And, um, you know, the, the Saudi woman has a huge role now in Saudi Arabia, and it's, getting, it's increasing every day. Um, so that's the way forward as far as we c we're concerned. Ambassador, I'm just I'm being told that the Lebanese information minister says that the Lebanese government condemns the pages that, uh, that were detonated um, in, in Lebanon, uh, those on the Hezbollah fighters, as Israeli aggression. We'll have to look at that as information comes out. It's very early days. Um, I don't have the information to answer a question about that, but... Uh, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary world we live in. And you're worried about the state of your region? Without question. Uh, if I wasn't, I'd be foolish. Frankly, what led to this moment was not only a long-standing historical and cultural connection between Saudi Arabia and Palestine, but also the brutal events of the past year in Gaza. Israel's military campaign, which saw the indiscriminate bombardment of Gaza, the cutting off of essential services such as water and electricity, and the deliberate blocking of food and medical supplies from entering the region, sparked outrage around the world. In the Middle East, where solidarity with the Palestinian cause runs deep, this latest wave of violence resonated particularly strongly, and Saudi Arabia, despite attempts to soften its public condemnation of Israel, could not remain silent forever. MBS had been trying to walk a delicate line for some time, balancing Saudi Arabia's aspirations for greater regional influence and modernization with its deep-rooted ties to the Palestinian cause. Some observers had speculated that MBS might ultimately follow the example of the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, who normalized relations with Israel under the Abraham Accords. But the weight of public opinion, combined with the harsh realities on the ground in Gaza, seems to have forced his hand. The Saudi Crown Prince's declaration was not only a significant policy shift, but also a rebuke of the Netanyahu administration's hardline approach to Palestinian statehood. For Netanyahu, this rejection from the most powerful and influential Arab state in the region will likely be seen as a setback to his broader ambitions. It also underscores the limitations of Israel's strategy of seeking normalization with Arab states, while bypassing the Palestinians entirely. The broader implication of this development is that the struggle for Palestinian statehood remains central to the politics of the Middle East. Despite decades of occupation, displacement and suffering, the Palestinian people's demand for an independent state remains a critical issue that cannot be ignored or sidelined through backdoor diplomatic manoeuvres. As MBS's statement has shown, any attempt to normalise relations with Israel without addressing this issue is doomed to failure, at least for the foreseeable future.